we're at the patient uh, blood management uh, session now. Um, this afternoon, we have uh, two esteemed speakers. Um, the, the first one is Prof. Mayer, who's from Austria. Uh, he says he's an anesthetist and insensitivist, um, but I'm sure he's a lot more. He's the current, um, current chair for NATA, which is the Network of Advancement of Patient Blood Management and Hemostasis and Thrombosis. I think that's the new name. Yeah, and, and the forum chair of the scientific committee for the European Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care. So in uh, interest of time, so I'll also introduce um, Prof. Richards. He just told me, just introduce him as a, a surgeon from the UK. Of course, he's more than that. Um, so um, Prof. Richards uh, has gone back to UK from Australia, and he's um, worked a lot in patient blood management um, from the surgeon's perspective, which we actually employ and, and use. And he's involved in a lot of uh, research like Prof. Mayer. And I will welcome them both. Um, so the Prof. Mayor will go first um, to talk to us about updates in blood management and strategy, and followed by Prof. Richards uh, with um, merits of preoperative treatment of anemia. And lastly will be from me, uh, strategies used to uh, reduce uh, blood loss during surgery. Okay, we'll start. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind introduction and these nice words. And it will be the aim of my 15 minutes to give you an overview about the updates in patient blood management. Most of you here probably are patient blood management enthusiasts. Some probably are non. The ones that are not, I will briefly introduce you to the concept. Patient blood management is a concept that is dealing with the three main daily clinical problems I have, namely bleeding, anemia and transfusion. It is very important to understand that a bleeding patient will be anemic and in the end will receive a transfusion. What is known from many, many different studies, and they just show you a small amount of them, is that bleeding, perioperative bleeding, is a killer. If you bleed a lot and you have a huge blood loss, you end up in anemia, you end up in transfusion, and this increases perioperative morbidity and mortality. But as well, Anemia is a killer. This is a very classical study from Musalam, which was published now more than 10 years ago. And what you can see here, a little counterintuitive, from the left to the right, in declining order, the preoperative hematocrit. And as you can see, the lower the preoperative hematocrit, the higher the risk to die. So anemia is a killer as well. And so is transfusion. You see here a huge study, nearly one million of patients were perioperative mortality and a composite endpoint of morbidity had been investigated depending on the number of PRBCs in units. And as you can clearly see, with an increasing number of uh, units transfused in the end, you have an increase in morbidity and mortality. What is important to note on this slide is that even smaller amount of transfusions are dangerous for patients and you're already there, have an increase in morbidity and mortality clearly indicating that all the three topics are a bundle of problems which increase each self and which end up in a vicious circle if your patient bleeds, if your patient is anemic, and in the end, if the patient has to be transfused, your outcome will be pretty bad and you should do something against that, and that is, in the end, patient blood management. Here, this is from the Malaysian Society of Patient Blood Management, the three main topics what patient blood management is, is it is the optimization of the erythropoiesis, the optimization of the tolerance to anemia, and the minimization of blood loss. And this very nice uh, blood drop comes from the initial concept of PBM, the free pillar concept. I will go into details later. There are several misconceptions about PBM that you can hear over and over again when you talk to clinicians about PBM. One misconception is that the main goal of PBM is to avoid transfusion. No, this is not the case. The main goal of PBM is to improve outcome. PBM results necessarily in low hemoglobin levels. No, this is not the case. It is the aim to avoid low hemoglobin levels. And you have uh, aggressive coagulation management if you use PBM. No, not necessarily. If you do the right thing, this is not the case. And by that, PBM is risky. No, again, false. If you do PBM, 
then you have very, very good results. And then will some of my slides with this telling you that these misconceptions are probably wrong. And if you do right, then even the costs will be reduced. What are now the basic elements of PBM? This is the classical de depiction of PBM, the three pillar model probably everyone of you has seen. You have the first pillar with the optimization of red blood cell mass, the second pillar with the minimization of blood loss, and the third pillar with the optimization of uh, anemia tolerance. You can divide this three pillar concept in a pre, intra, and post operative phase, ending up in a nine uh, field matrix. But in the end, it's only important that it's about the three topics, anemia, transfusion, and bleeding, that you have to avoid. Not to go too much into details, but several questions are discussed over and over again if you talk about PBM. And these are, for the three pillars, probably the most important questions that are discussed uh, throughout the literature. In pillar one, there are many, many publications about iron. Which iron should I give? When should I give it and how much should I give? The second point is EPO, probably less discussed but not, uh, not less important, are folic acid, vitamin B12, and to investigate what the reasons for anemia are. These are the main topics for scientific approaches to PBM. In the second pillar, what is investigated and discussed a lot is point of care coagulation monitoring, adequate coagulatory therapy, and there you can have own congresses where you can discuss about whether you should use fibrinogen, whether one-to-one-to-one -to -one -to -one approach, tranexamic acid, or PCCs are the right way to go. Cell salvage is one point you can hear a lot about in the PBM world, hemostyptics and phlebotomies that are iatrogenic and probably are not needed. And it's very important to note that we bleed a lot of our patients unnecessarily in order to get good blood results. The third pillar is all about restrictive versus liberal transfusion. And if you go to different congresses, you will have heard a lot of publications about liberal and restrictive transfusion. What is more and more interesting are physiological transfusion triggers, and I will also go not too much here into details, and furthermore, auxiliary measures. So these are the main topics of PBM, and you will not be surprised that in the last year there were a lot of publications that were dealing exact with these hot topics in PBM. And especially there have been a lot of meta-analyses that uh, combined the existing evidence in order to guide our clinical approach. So first of all, let's talk about preoperative iron therapy. This is the classical algorithm published by Manuel Munoz in the fit to fly paper now also nearly 10 years ago. What should you do if you are undergoing uh, surgery? Then if the indication is done by your surgeon, you do an anesthetic, measure, an anesthetic measurement four to four, five weeks prior surgery. If your patient is anemic, you measure transferrin saturation. If transferrin saturation is low, you also measure ferritin. If ferritin is low, you give iron. If ferritin is high, then you give EPO and a little bit of iron. And if your transferrin saturation is high and you measure vitamin B12 and folate, then you either have a megaloblastic anemia or any other causes. So in the end, very, very easy concept. Nevertheless, this concept is sometimes discussed whether the application of iron is efficient. This is a very recent meta-analysis if iron is especially combined with erythropoietin, and in my opinion, to date, there is no question that if you do especially the combination of both, you end up in an effective measure to reduce the perioperative transfusion needs. It's important to note, in many of these meta-analyses, you will see a reduction of transfusion needs. In the end, this is not what patient blood management wants, but it's the most easy thing to measure, and it's very, very easy to find out whether these things I propose now to you are uh, achievable and are efficient. However, it is not the goal to reduce the number of transfusions by patient blood management. From the second pillar, last year there has been a meta-analysis about viscoelastic testing, and if you take a look again at transfusion needs, no doubt, if you use viscoelastic testing, then in the end, you will reduce the amount of blood you administer. Cell salvage, there you have 
the hugest Cochrane analysis of all of these topics. You see really a lot of, lot of publications. I copied you out the last line. Very clear, without any doubt, cell salvage is very, very useful if you want to reduce your transfusion, transfusion needs. Tranexamic acid, also something that has been investigated over and over again. Again, a meta-analysis from the last year. No doubt, this is the last line in over 13,000 patients. Again, tranexamic acid works. If you want to reduce the number of transfusion, this is one of the topics to go. Very recently, at the end of last year, there has been this publication where they investigated whether it makes sense to use smaller sampling tubes. If you go to the intensive care unit, every of your patients will have at least everyday laboratory values and probably every four to six hours of blood gas analysis. And if your patient is septic, you will take every day or every second day blood cultures and in the end you will take away 50 to 100 milliliters each and every day from your patient. And the idea of this study was to reduce the size of the sampling tubes and what they could show is that uh, they could reduce the amount of blood that had been reduced. They were not able to demonstrate very clearly that this resulted in a reduction of the number of transfusions. But just from a logical point of view, there is no question that this should work. One of the topics where we do not only have data for the number of transfusions, but also for mortality is uh, restrictive transfusion, meaning transfusing just at a threshold of a hemoglobin of seven gram per deciliter. And this is again a Cochrane analysis from the last year. And what you can see here is that there is no difference between a restrictive and a liberal transfusion group. So in the end, if you go restrictive, there is no signal for harm for your patients to do so. And on the other hand, there is no need that any patient in your hospital really needs a hemoglobin of 10 or even above 10 gram per deciliter. So the first real proof of the efficiency and efficacy of patient blood management came from Western Australia. This is a study where they clearly demonstrated that not only the number of transfusion could be reduced, but also the odds ratio for mortality significantly declined, clearly showing that PDM in the end works and is beneficial for the patient. But there are also studies here from the last year, a study from Patrick Maibom from Germany, who also investigated whether the implementation of patient blood management in more than 400 hospitals resulted in a decline of blood transfusion and the change of mortality. And what they could demonstrate is that they could reduce the number of blood transfusions per patient. And on the other hand, they did a non-inferiority analysis and they could clearly show that there was no signal of, of harm if patients underwent PDM in this role. So it is not only effective, it is also safe. So in my opinion, with the sum of these studies, most of these, if not all, misconceptions about patient blood management should be solved. And you can use these publications in your daily clinical life if you meet someone that is not too happy if you try to implement patient blood management in your hospital. In my opinion, the main goal of patient blood management clearly is to improve outcomes, nothing else. You avoid with patient blood management anemia. You result in an adequate coagulation management, especially if you use devices that end up in uh, viscoelastic testing. By that, patient blood management is very effective and it can reduce cost. It is a global necessity. The WHO also had a policy brief where they clearly indicated that uh, patient blood management is something not to think about, but to implement in your daily clinical practice. And therefore, I strongly encourage you to use PDM on a daily clinical basis and to try to implement in your own hospital. PBM is avoiding bleeding and anemia and transfusion. It improves outcome. There is an overwhelming amount of evidence in the end that can be used to uh, fight for PBM. We are far away from the full implementation and there is still a long way to go. 
But if we achieve this success in the end end, we will have a win-win-win situation, a win for patients, a win for doctors, and also a win for those who have to pay for all of that. One last word. Um, if you want to hear more about patient blood management, at the moment I'm the chair of NATA. Come to Bologna, we will have a two-day program where we discuss only these topics and you will hear the latest evidence about patient blood management and all connected fields. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. May. We're doing the questions at the end. Okay, so we have some um, time at the end for your questions and answers. So it's Prof. Richards to me. Great, thanks very much, Jens. My name's Toby Richards. I'm a practicing vascular surgeon and I've been in this field of anemia management for about 20 years uh, from my time as a transplant surgeon. Uh, so I have the dubious pleasure of being the only surgeon here in a sea of anesthetists. Um, I'm quite happy to take money off anyone. Um, and these are my disclosures uh, for a variety of grants and work that I've done. Now, what I'd like to do is not tell you my opinion, which might be novel for a surgeon on a stage in front of anesthetists. But I'd like to talk about data and the levels of data. Level one would be high quality data, which would be a multi-center randomized controlled trial. And below that, you have single center clinical trials, which could be a high quality observational trial or a uh, single center RCT. Then you get onto co cohort and pilot studies. And below that, associative data, which is often retrospective database analyses. And below that is opinion. Now, each of these levels of evidence build on one another, which will give you the information for you guys to make your own decision. And how does this translate into how we as trialists conduct this? Well, if we're going for retrospective data, we go for large databases like the US Veterans Database, or in the United Kingdom, we have large audits from the Blood and Transplant Society. Literature reviews can be a variety, from narratives all the way through to Cochrane meta-analyses, or James Lynn's partnerships, network meta-analyses, etc. You then develop your initial trials, which can be cohorts or pilots, and then you get on to the big randomized controlled trials. These data all feed in to one another. So as you start off from opinion to database to pilot studies, you hone down the question you're asking based on the evidence. So where did we start? This is where we started with the US Veterans Database uh, actually almost 14 years ago. Um, this, how do you get to this? Well, this started in Pizza Express, just off, uh, just behind uh, Tottenham Court Road in UCL with me and Donald Spahn and Khalid. And we showed that in this large database analysis that anemia was associated with a worse outcome. And these data now you'll be very familiar with and it's been reproduced on many occasions. But we then take that retrospective data and we analyze it prospectively here in um, 190 locations throughout the UK. And we validated the retrospective data in a prospective data series. And if you're anemic, you tend to be older and slightly sicker, but you're more likely to require a blood transfusion, more likely to have a worse outcome in hospital. So anemia is bad. But association doesn't necessarily equal causality. Is this just a marker of ill health? So we then get on to the question of what we can do about it. And the new products of intravenous iron came in in 2008 and 2009, which enable us to give a full treatment dose of iron, about 1,000 milligrams or more, rapidly, 15 minutes, with the same side effect profile of an antibiotic. And intravenous iron appears to be better than oral iron to increase your hemoglobin and treat anemia. So does two plus two equal four? Early data showed that this might be a one size fit at all. The more anemic you are, the faster your response and the better your response to intravenous iron. And an initial pilot single center randomized controlled trial with a degree of bias because it was open label and there was quite a lot of crossovers suggested that the use of intravenous iron in people with anemia prior to surgery 
improve patient outcomes by reducing length of stay and improving hemoglobin. But getting on to more nuanced trials, and this trial from the IVICA group was a randomized controlled trial out of Nottingham where they took people with colorectal cancer and compared oral iron to intravenous iron two weeks prior to surgery. The hypothesis was that oral iron wouldn't work, but actually it did. It worked really quite well. And in both arms of the trial, the hemoglobin was increased and there was no significant difference between the two groups. Then came a very large trial. Now this was cardiac surgery and it included anyone with anemia. There was no definition of the anemia in this group. And they got a blunderbuss approach of let's give them some iron, some EPO, some B12 and folate, about $1,000 worth of treatment. And they showed that it reduced the need for blood transfusion, but there was no impact on the patient outcome. So the question is, are you just swapping a bag of iron for a bag of red stuff? And in line with what Yen said, does this actually improve patient outcomes? It shows that it does work, but we need to know the outcomes. So where we were was that it was a good idea. Anemia is bad, iron works, and it looks like it's probably going to reduce transfusion, and that's probably going to be a good thing. So we undertook the multicenter randomized controlled trial called PREVENT in people undergoing major surgery, such as a vertine hysterectomy, a pancreatoduodenectomy, or a colonic resection, were randomized two weeks prior to surgery to intravenous iron or placebo. The follow-up was good. We had greater than 97% data ascertainment, so we had a very few dropouts, very few missing data. And this was your usual cohort of patients. They were quite unwell, and half of them, importantly, were women. They underwent big surgery. The commonest operation was a vertine hysterectomy followed by a Whipple's. So big surgery, mostly lasting about three hours or five hours of anesthetic time. They were all anemic, and they all got their intervention in a timely manner two weeks prior to surgery. We used a lot of blood. One in three got transfused because this was big open surgery. And a lot of blood was used, and we used just about every definition you can think of of blood transfusion there. And did intravenous iron work? Well, the, this graph I'd like you to remember, because most people started off at about 110. And yes, intravenous iron worked to increase the hemoglobin. But this is with those transfused as well, but the big effect you can see is after surgery. But the primary outcome showed no difference in the use of, blo in, of blood transfusion in this patient group. There was absolutely nada, zip, nothing between the two groups. So this was absolutely not the result that everyone wanted, not the result that I wanted, having built my career on the fact that intravenous iron was going to reduce transfusion. Uh, but it was the result, nevertheless. And the it was supported by the subgroup analysis. So no matter how you defined iron deficiency, or you looked at older, sicker patients, or you looked at the per protocol analysis, the results remained the same. But you have to bear in mind what the purpose of this trial was to do. The trial was in the National Health Service, and the question asked by the funder was, should we change our practice such that all people undergoing surgery with anemia should have intravenous iron as part of their routine care. That's the design of the trial. And the answer to that question was no, and that was timely during the COVID outbreak, which showed that patients were not being disadvantaged. The trial has since been validated by the FIT study, which was published in Lancet Hematology, which, where they randomized people with colorectal cancer to intravenous iron or placebo and reproduce pretty much identical results to the PREVENT study, but I bring you to the graphs at the bottom, the biggest treatment effect was after surgery. So this was all a bit disappointing. And where are we now? And so the questions I want to ask is, remember, the association was anemia and outcome. The association was not 
iron deficiency or B12 deficiency and outcome. So we need to look into the causality of anemia and what does that mean. When you go back to the data, so the 117 randomized controlled trials in intravenous iron, anemia alone, without any predefined definition of the causality, was the most common inclusion criteria. An absolute iron deficiency with a ferritin less than 30 is less than 15% of the world literature, and a lot was deemed functional iron deficiency. Now, functional iron deficiency is where you have iron in the body, but inflammation or chronic disease or general badness means that you can't access or utilize that iron. And it really came around from the FAIR HF study around about 12 years ago, where they said ferritin less than 100 or TSATs less than 20% is functional iron deficiency. There's not a lot of evidence behind the concept of functional iron deficiency. It was actually a hypothesis. It was ferritin less than 100, which is a very nice round number. But it's been used nevertheless. And when you look at the PREVENT study, it was impossible to undertake ferritin tests in a timely manner prior to surgery. We tried it, couldn't get it done. And in three months, not a single center managed to do it. So we had a pre we recruited deliberately more people, anticipating 75% would have a ferritin less than 100, and indeed it was 82%. So we were powered for iron deficiency anemia. But when you break it down on subgroup analysis, and you look at an absolute iron deficiency, ferritin less than 30, functional iron deficiency, TSATs less than 20%, or neither. The big treatment effect here is in those with a ferritin less than 30. So the take home message is the treatment effect produce a minimal clinical difference greater than uh, 10 grams per liter. So a ferritin less than 30 in the presence of anemia produces a minimal clinical effect. But numbers are small. They're about a third of the overall population. So if you have someone who's anemic, undertaking a ferritin at that time would be sensible. Um, the uh, middle slide is interesting. That's the functional iron deficiency anemia. And that shows that there's no benefit prior to surgery, but there is benefit after surgery. And only around about 15% had normal iron stores. So that answers that question in the setting of PREVENT, and we can only address that within the setting of that one clinical trial. But the benefit of randomized controlled trials is we can bring them together and undertake a meta-analysis. So in this meta-analysis, we did the five randomized controlled trials, which had colorectal cancer patients. And instead of just having 30% of 487, i.e. 112 patients, we were able to find just under 500 half of whom had IV iron and half that didn't. And in the population of people with colorectal cancer, the use of intravenous iron increases hemoglobin and does reduce transfusion. So that begs the question, is that because in colorectal cancer you have GI blood loss, so it's blood loss that's leading to the iron deficiency anemia as opposed to inflammation that's leading to sequestration? And I come back to this slide again. And this slide again shows that intravenous iron has the greatest effect after surgery. Is that similar to colorectal cancer where the causality of the iron deficiency is blood loss? And the big thing that we found, which got missed, is there was a significant reduction in readmission rates to hospital in the time period after surgery. So when people had gone home, Yes, the, the trial was designed to look at outcomes in hospital, but when they went home, the readmission rate was almost halved in those people who had intravenous iron compared to placebo. Data that were verified by the FIT study in colorectal cancer. So we have a secondary endpoint suggesting a reduction in readmission. That's associated with a massive treatment effect or the main treatment effect of the intravenous iron. So we go back to the literature. And these are data from uh, the Mayo, where we looked at outcomes of discharge hemoglobin and rates of readmission. And we showed a direct treatment effect. And essentially, if you've got a hemoglobin less than 10 on discharge, your readmission rate is doubled. 
from database analysis. So we did a prospect of audit again across Australia, 52 centers, and we collected outcomes from people undergoing major surgery. And we showed that about 20% of people are anemic prior to surgery. And even in Australia, where the use of intravenous iron is extremely common, only about 5% of eligible people actually get intravenous iron prior to major surgery, because logistically it's really difficult. Whereas around about two thirds of people leave hospital with anemia. And anemia, sorry, I should go back there, anemia was associated with increased rates of readmission. And particularly if you went home with a hemoglobin less than 100, you had a significantly higher rate of readmission. So where are we today? Should everybody with anemia get intravenous iron? Well, the randomized control trial data doesn't support that but it does support those with an absolute iron deficiency in anemia with a ferritin less than 30. But I would propose that anyone, anyone with a ferritin less than 30 should be treated with iron because that is absolute iron deficiency. And half the audience here are women of whom around about one in eight will right now have iron deficiency anemia because there is no national screening program in any country in the world or the most common nutritional deficiency that affects women, apart from the American Basketball Association. The other group, if you want to pick winners, would be colorectal cancer patients, because level one evidence supports the use of intravenous iron to reduce transfusion in that setting. So if you want to pick a winner to start your hospital practice, the colorectal cancer patients. One thing that has come apparent is that inflammation is cleverer than us. The inflammatory cascade to impact iron metabolism is something that we need to elucidate more on. We know from the clinical trials in heart failure, of which there are 17 randomized controlled trials on several thousands of patients, that the concept of functional iron deficiency has been brought into question. There's absolutely no doubt that if you've got a ferritin less than 30 and you're anemic, your heart failure status will improve significantly, but there is a significant diminishing return after that fact. And a ferritin less than 100 may not be the appropriate definition of functional iron deficiency. And I just put that out there as my own opinion. But I think the other area we need to explore now is patients on discharge. We've focused so heavily on preoperative management and preoperative optimization. And we need to look to how we're sending our patients home because they're often more anemic they do get bounced back into hospital. And is there a process we can do to enhance recovery after surgery? Thank you very much. We'll just wait for the slides to come up. Um, and thank you to the two previous speakers gave us a lot of evidence on, on how we move forward with patient blood management. Um, but my talk will be more sort of more pragmatic, what we want to do in actual fact when we um, have patients that comes through for surgery and to reduce their risk or reduce their blood loss during surgery. Um, so um, I'm from Malaysia, Kuala Lumpur is my city. Um, I practice in Hospital Chancellor John Kumakus, which is another university hospital. Apart, so I think a lot of you would know University of Malaya, which is one of the oldest uh, universities there. We're the other one that's big here in the city. Um, I'm an anesthetist and also an intensive care. Um, no disclaimer, I have none for this talk. So what we're doing is um, to reduce intraoperative uh, blood loss, we have to go look from the start. So what can we do to reduce um, blood loss during surgery? So preoperatively, so and also intraoperatively. So those are topics surrounding my, talk, my talk. So preoperatively, um, the, the patients that we're concerned with are usually those patients who are on dual antiplatelet, uh, which of course um, we would know without saying. If we continue, then patient will, will bleed. Um, and, and usually patients who are on these medications 
uh, patients that has cardiac stents and the reason for them being put it in is because of their cardiac disease. So how do we handle the um, dual anticoagulants? So I'll be focusing on a few of guidelines, but for illustrative purposes, I've used a European Society of Cardiologists one that they published about two years ago because they have nice uh, flow charts. But I know the Society of Thoracic Surgeons and um, Emergency Cost Extracorporeal Society also produced um, a guideline in America, uh, which was published the year before then. Um, so, patients on antiplatelets. So usually um, the balance is to find the risk of bleeding and the thrombosis, the, the stent being blocked, basically. So um, the care is to to figure out the surgery that the patient's going for um, has what kind of risk of bleeding risk. Um, interestingly, our neuroaxial block is considered high risk bleeding. So if we plan for patients to go for regional central neuroaxial block, so that comes under high bleeding risk. And then we have to balance it with um, will that stent be blocked? Okay. So for for patients that stents was placed in for a recent MI, um, they are primary event and not elective. Um, the suggestion is not to, it's not recommended in the next slide, I will go on through that, um, that you do not stop your dual antiplatelet less than three months if the indication for that stent was um, NML. NML. Um, but if it's an elective, you, you can opt to, uh, may consider to, um, but not recommend it less than one month, but beyond two to the six months, you can consider uh, to interrupt it. So if, if there's increased risk of bleeding, and yeah, there's also high risk of thrombosis, especially in patients with history of uh, block stents before, despite um, dual antiplatelets or AF uh, leading to strokes, um, then you can defer, try to defer, uh, but most of the times life doesn't work that way, and uh, you may have to interrupt it um, by bridging. This is the recommendation from the guideline. Um, both of these medications, the glycoprotein inhibitors and also the uh, gang oh, sorry, pronunciation, can uh, gecolor, sorry, um, um, are not available in Malaysia. So what happens to these kind of patients in my country, or especially in my institution, they just we just stop it. And, and, and we have to carry on if it's an emergency uh, situation. But if it's purely elective, um, and then uh, we can plan it. Um, and if there's no risk of um, thrombosis, increased risk of thrombosis, so there's a suggestion you can actually continue the aspirin and also interrupt um, the P2Y12, uh, the ticagla for the clopidogrel, which is common in my country, which is clopidogrel, which is five days, or ticagla is is um, three minimum of three days and pasugrel of seven days. Sorry for the pronunciation, being nervous, and all the law comes out weirdly. Okay, so the evidence is there that the recommendation says if you should try and complete their dual antiplatelets uh, before their planned surgeries. Planned surgeries is good, but if you don't have planned surgeries and, and they come in for emergency surgeries and, and you have to deal with that dual antiplatelet, so um, you may have to interrupt them. But it's not recommended within uh, the one month uh, after an elective one, but especially you have to prolong it for patients that was a stent was placed in post uh, acute coronary syndrome. syndrome. Okay, so the next population that we would like to address is as we increase your um, bleeding risk is uh, patients that has anticoagulants. All right. Um, so why would they be on anticoagulants? Okay. Right. So um, apart from trying to decide whether the risk is there. So we, we, should, we should discuss with the surgeon um, the bleeding risks. Um, there are, you know, in the guidelines, there are lists of um, surgeries that's considered as high risk, as in also dual antiplatelets. So if patients um, are going for uh, abdominal surgery, uh, especially liver, cancer surgery, AAA, that's understandable, that they're all high risk. But if... if um, 
upon discussion that even though it comes from a low low risk, you, you know the bleeding may, may increase, then you can discuss with the surgeons and decide on how to go forward with the uh, dual antiplatelets and also the anticoagulants. For anticoagulants, um, there's two types now. So there's the, um, the vitamin K antagonist, which uses warfarin, and our non-vitamin um, K antagonist, oral anticoagulants, which is uh, shortly called NOAC, um, that uh, countries like Dabigatran, there's direct two inhibitors or the factor 10A inhibitors. Um, um, so based looking at that flow chart, um, depending on the reason why the patient is on um, an anticoagulant, um, there's a recommendation for to consider or should consider for bridging. And when they bridge, uh, it's converted to a unfractionated um, heparin or low molecular weight heparin. Um, but there's also if your bleeding risk is low, uh, for example, for like cholecystectomy, um, if patients on vitamin uh, K antagonists like warfarin, um, it is recommended to, you can actually continue that warfarin on a lower INR uh, target. Uh, so you may actually drop it down to two maybe. Okay, that's the personal statement, but they didn't suggest any range. So if they were target like 2.5 to 3.5, then you can lower it, lower the target. And also, same goes with NOAC. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a short introduction. I will, I will go that in the next few slides. But if um, the thrombosis risk is also low, so you actually um, uh, interrupt, which I'll go into the next slide. But there's no bridging. Okay? It's not required. It's not suggested in, the, in this guideline. Okay. Um, so when to stop your... Um, anticoagulants. This one specifically to, uh, to NOAC. Um, with this, this diagram explains when you st stop and start in patients with normal renal function and with the risk um, of their procedure, procedural risk of bleeding. Okay. So why I chose this picture to go up because it nicely draws the picture in a very colorful way and it's very visual that you can actually easily pragmatically follow. So um, if you uh, focus on your uh, left side, um, the, the, the buttons there is minor, low, or high-risk bleeding. And, and the next one comes through as what drugs you are using and how the patients are taking as you go in through to the left. Sorry. So for I'll focus down there into the high-risk bleeding patients, so which concerns us. Okay, especially with our neuroaxial, central neuroaxial block, um, spinal and epidural. So those patients that's going for, uh, with normal renal function, so you should stop at least 48 hours before a spinal or epidural according to this guideline. Okay, and you want to restart it at least um, prophylactically for DVT for the first 48 hours, and then on the third day, then you may restart. The NOAC. Um, so this is when you are facing with patients that has renal um, disease, so their renal functions have reduced. So the first box there on the top is for the minor bleeding. So that goes for like glaucoma, all of their minor surgeries. Uh, so that that's all right. So they say you can um, do not, can do um, levels if you have or uh, twelve hours. 12 hours uh, or to 24 hours um, intake on daily regimen and or, uh, uh, sorry, BD, BD or daily regimen mm -hmm. and resume them um, at the same of the day. Um, so as you go through the diagram, um, your renal function reduces. Look at the, uh, the left side and your GFR has come down. So of course at less than 30, uh, it will become very high risk, and, and usually um, patients are not on dabigatran at that point, so they're not indicated. Um, but for uh, NOAC, for the other NOAC, so like Abizaban or Rivazazaban and Dadozaban, okay, well, I'm not familiar with the other last one because I don't have that in my country. Um, so you, for high bleeding patients, you have to stop them about at least more than 48 hours with renal dysfunction. So you have to be aware when you handle patients that also um, have renal function compromised, you need to know when was their last dose they've taken. 
So this is where your history taking and sometimes I know the patients are elderly that comes through you and they're actually not sure when they last taken it. If you have the luxury of checking assays, uh, that'd be good, but um, but we, we don't. Um, but um, mindful, uh, we may have to reverse it. All right. So coming through now to if we need to reverse. So if patients coming through and, and not coming for an elective procedure, um, we have to decide uh, uh, with the surgeon, definitely, um, how urgent, because we won't be able to decide the urgency of the surgery. The surgeons will guide us on that. And, and on discussion on the pa especially entertaining patient safety, um, the risk of that bleed and the urgency of that procedure that needs to be done. So if it's immediate within minutes, then we would um, check our uh, coagulation profile. And, and if we have that plasma level, uh, you can do it, but my country, we don't have it. And um, if the, the levels are prolonged, uh, the, the coagulation profile is prolonged, then we may have to treat it. But if that was last taken, if that was last taken um, more than 12 hours ago, so you may actually proceed um, as the um, sort of other elective procedures. Um, but if it's not, if it's within that 12 hours, so you may have to consider reversal. So um, prothrombin complex concentrate has come into play here. I think um, Prof May mentioned. Um, but in my country, that's very expensive. And so we, we won't be able to um, deliver that uh, for our patients. Uh, when optimizing them before procedures. So what we do is uh, we end up um, taking their level and see if that's prolonged, whatever we need to treat, we will treat. And if we have to reverse it, um, we will reverse with fresh frozen plasma. So that's the other alternative that's, uh, I think, quite readily available in many countries. Okay, but if, um, uh, if that surgery can be deferred a bit in a few hours, so try to complete it that 12 hours so that your, your bleeding um, risk is reduced. Um, but if, if you can prolong it further, then we can discuss with surgeons, maybe can we wait a couple of days and, and, and um, carry that later. But once, if, after we reverse it, even though we have to actually check the level and, um, and, and, and may have to treat it even before we proceed it again. All right, so what can we do intraoperatively? So, this one, um, I think all of us in uh, anesthetists uh, been made known that we have to keep our patients warm and keep them normothermic because the evidence was there quite a while ago where, where a degree of uh, drop in temperature, uh, you will increase your blood loss by 20%. So we do warm our patients, we bundle them up. I'm sure we do that all the time. But in actual fact, in the evidence where um, uh, the meta-analysis um, indicated about active body warming uh, surface. Um, your blower, your bear hugger, how, how well does it actually, in evidence, um, produce change or an effect? Um, although it, it, it's not significant on, on this meta-analysis, um, but the evidence are very low. So we have to take the pinch of salt of this um, result, uh, but we continue to warm our patients and keep them normothermic because we know the evidence that the bleeding risk will increase, your enzymes won't function well and your calcium won't function well and it don't clock well. Um, or uh, we can administer antifibrinolytic. Um, the agent that's available in my country is only uh, trinesamic acid, um, which I think Prof May also uh, did sum up about its use. Um, the evidence came about uh, when Prof. Miles and his team, um, part of Africa's uh, investigators, I think it's in 2017, uh, where they investigated uh, for patients that are going for cardiac surgery, received uh, transcendental acid uh, compared to placebo. Um, initially, he ran the, he's an, he and his group ran the surgery, uh, sorry, the research with 100 milligrams per kilogram um, more than 30 minutes after the induction. Um, giving tranexamic acid, um, what they found that the, there's an increased risk of um, seizures. So I think about after about 1,000 plus of patients that they've recruited, 
um, they've dropped the um, infusion of uh, tranosomic acid to 50 milligrams uh, per, kilo per kilogram. So, and that um, has shown um, a surrogate of um, saying that the blood transfusion and blood products transfusions has reduced. So that that's good. That's a good sign. So the use of tranosomic acid. So we translate that because it's coronary artery surgery, we, we translate it to as major surgery, so we can actually use them in major surgeries. But in actual fact, whether we do have any evidence um, that's being used in other surgeries in major, that's considered major bleeding risk. Um, this is a recent um, meta-analysis, sorry, systematic review uh, with network meta-analysis um, in Cochrane, which was published last month, somewhere in the middle month. Um, so what they found um, ranked highest. So with this um, uh, systematic review, they found multiple methods of administration of tranosomic acid. Uh, the highest being ranked is intraarticularly and orally, with doses used more than three grams. Um, Pre-incision, uh, intraoperatively and postoperatively, showed less fewer blood transfusion in 100. Sorry, 147 had le uh, few blood transfusion per 1,000 people. So it, it shows there is less pa patients being transfused having, um, having um, major orthopedic surgeries, which is good. But in that um, uh, systematic review, they weren't able to recommend any dosing or a route of administration or uh, when's the best timing, was it before, during, or after? But what they note, the higher doses um, tended to rank higher. A lot of uh, the system, uh, the, the research used higher doses uh, with mixed route, meaning they give it intravenously or orally or orally and intravenously. But what they found was intraarticularly and orally um, had less uh, blood transfusions in 1,000 people, in 1,000 people. Um, but what good signal is that they did not find any higher doses caused more clots. But what I couldn't find in there, whether they used as high as um, um, the Atticus group was using, whether they saw a lot more seizures. So um, that hasn't been shown there. All right. Um, lastly, I will touch on um, a little bit on goal-directed transfusion algorithms um, with incorporating point-of-care testing. So it's basically if you if you have TAG or Rotem, which is um, vesicle elastic testing, which uh, Prof. May also mentioned, um, then you can guide your transfusions uh, to reduce your bleeding risk. Okay, so that's that's part of the strategy if you want to use it. Um, unfortunately, like this machine, uh, expensive. So there's only a few centers in my country that has a uh, point of care, which is mainly in the cardiac, in the cardiac um, OTs. Um, but uh, but in my center, we don't have it. Um, so what evidence do we have for that? So um, I think quite a while ago, um, 2015, that showed if you use combined with um, other platelet function tests, um, the, the, they achieve greater reduction in blood loss, meaning um, there's like less than 112 mils being transfused compared to not being monitored. Um, so what what it means is, is just if you have uh, the capability to monitor that, um, you can test the platelet fibrinogen interaction and see mm -hmm. with that the shape of your tag or your your rotum um, output and, and decide your therapy appropriately. So what it can do, it can differentiate all the causes of the um, um, uh, cause of the bleeding. So you may have dilution and depletion of coagulation factors, especially in the cardiac surgery, but we can also have them in other surgeries. So, so like platelet activation and dysfunction, but that's related to extracorporeal. But yes, we can also have that like patients uh, in sepsis or fibrinolysis or patient who's actually using anticoagulants, then we can detect that and then we can target our, our transfusion and therapy appropriately. So my take home message, um, so there are many strategies. I'm sure there's some that I've left out like specifically, but I think in combination um, therapy that we can do as anesthetists and, and be uh, part of the tr treating team 
uh, for the patient is how, how we manage uh, antiplatelets and anticoagulant patients uh, who are on them before surgery. And, and of course, intraoperatively um, keeping them warm and um, the use of uh, trifenamic acid um, if, you, if you have them and, and also the goal directed transfusion on cooperating point of care testing. But what I did not describe here is I think the, some of the strategies which um, Prof. Mayer mentioned, um, the intraoperative blood salvage uh, can also, it's not directly reduce blood loss, uh, if answering the title of, the, of the, the talk, but it can actually basically, you don't discard what's lost, you give it back to the patient. So what's lost in actual, um, in actual fact was returned. So I don't know whether that's a minimum, but yeah. So that's the idea. Um, that, but there are evidence uh, showing that if you use blood salvage, actually patients reduce their blood loss and also acute normovolemic hemodilution. And the other components are actually the surgeon side. So, uh, I mean, we don't govern, we never govern our surgeons um, what they do, isn't it? So, um, but we do discuss with them, you know, if we can go minimally invasive, that'd be good. Um, of course, they nowadays use electrosurgery devices and all of their skills with the topical, uh, sorry, topical hemostatic agents. All right. Okay, that's my reference. And thank you for your kind attention. Um, sorry, I think there's some time for questions. We can probably answer some of the questions very quickly. Yes, uh, thank so you. Time's up. Um, Jens, do you want to answer the question about tranexamic acid? You had a question about tranexamic acid, whether it works and whether it should be used. So this is, in my opinion, a real box of Pandora to open it because we can have a whole Congress about that. Mm. But uh, tranexamic acid, in the end, in my opinion, clearly works, even if you have to say that the results that have been obtained be it by the woman trial, be it by the crash free trial, is not as big as would be anticipated. So, yes, it works. It is a therapeutic drug, but not most of the time it's used prophylactically. Just the questions about iron deficiency, the readmissions in prevent were uh, independently adjudicated. So, those were unplanned readmissions only. We excluded all the chemo radiotherapy. Um, the other question was about the WHO definition of anemia. I'll be very quick there. Uh, Lancet Hematology came out 12 hours ago by Sentinel and Parisha, so I suggest you read that. Um, but essentially those, uh, I haven't read it yet, but the WHO definitions remain 12 and 13. So thank you very much. Yeah, I would, I would like to thank the speakers um, to come all the way to Singapore and be with us at the WPA. Um, and, and, and thank you for your kind attention. Thank you.